All right, these are the notes for module 57 about social influence. So social influence is looking at how um, we are affected by the others around us as well as how we affect them. So starting off with empathy. Um, empathy is obviously a huge part of social influence. And so, um, you know, you oftentimes see this case a scenario where you have a kid that's kind of upset and uh, maybe in this case the kid's crying. And you have another little kid that comes along and pats their back or gives them a hug or gives them a sad face and says, oh, what's wrong? Okay, those are all instances of showing some empathy and we are influenced by and we mimic what other people are doing. And um, kids will sometimes even cry because somebody else is crying. They don't really even know why they're crying. Uh, but we do have um, social influence. We can also be influenced by conformity. Um, conformity um, is the idea that we adjust your behavior and your thinking to match the group. Um, and this is oftentimes what uh, people complain about uh, teenagers and say that teenagers are a bunch of conformists. You say you want to be individuals, but yet at the same point in time, you are just more likely to conform to what the group does because you want to be, you want to fit in, right? So um, Solomon Ash um, did an experiment uh, that is uh, illustrating this idea of conformity. Um, this is Solomon Ash right here, and here's his experiment. And it's not it's not as flashy and as interesting as, for example, um, the Milgram experiment or um, Zabardo's still uh, prison experiment, but it is interesting the uh, effects of this. So what he did was he brought a bunch of people together, um, maybe, you know, five, six people, um, and everybody but one was in on it, okay? They were in on, they were working with Ash, okay? So they, he brought them together, he showed them this um, little picture here, and they, he said, okay, here's exhibit one, this line, here's exhibit two, and we have three lines, A, B, and C, okay? I want you to tell me which line you think um, is the most similar to the first line, exhibit one. Um, and so he'd go around the table and he'd ask people to tell them. And person one would say C, person two would say C, person three would say C, person four would say C. And it gets to the fifth person who is not, who's the person we're actually testing, and they'd ask, okay, which one do you think? And the first person's looking at it and is like, uh, I guess C. Um, but they, it's funny because even in your book they have a picture of this study and you can see that like the, the confusion on the face of the participants are like, am I missing something? This This looks pretty obvious. It should be a, but everybody else says C, so I'll guess I go with C. Yeah, they must be right, right? You conform to what the group is saying. You adjust your thinking because of, to match the group because you don't know what else to do. So there's a couple reasons why you do this. So why do we conform? The first reason is normative um, social influence, and this is the idea that we want to be liked right? You have this desire for approval. So, for example, in Ash's experiment, people, um, you know, wanted to say C maybe because they, you know, hey, I, I want everybody to like me. I don't want everybody to think I'm a dope, okay? So, part of it has to do with that. Um, this is interesting because um, it says, uh, the other girls conform by mimicking her apparel. Um, this is especially early teenagers. Um, I'm sure you've seen girls like this, that uh, they are all dressed very similar and done their hair very similar because they all want to get approval from the group. So, the best um, way to do that is to be able to mimic each other. Now, the other reason we conform is uh, for informational social influence, and this is that desire to be correct. Um, and you look for others to help with this. And so in Ash's experiment, you look at it and you say, well, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe they're smarter than me, right? Um, so maybe that explains, you know, why they say C, and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, A. So you you try and go with something um, that, okay, uh, maybe they're they're right and I'm wrong. Okay. Um, this cartoon says, well, heck, if you are, if all you smart cookies agree, who am I to dissent? It's very hard to go against the group um, if everybody else is saying something that you're not thinking. So sometimes we conform from the standpoint of trying to uh, be correct. Um, I talked with other students that were saying, you know, it depends upon the class. You know, some classes where you feel less sure of yourself, you're much more likely to conform to whatever the group says because you're much less sure that you have the correct answer. 
Okay, whereas if it's a particular class where, oh yeah, I, I get it, you're much more confident, you're much more likely to assert yourself. So, uh, social influence, what about obedience? Oops, I forgot to animate here, so excuse myself. So, obedience, so we talked about conformity, what about obedience? Well, if you remember back to the Milgram experiment, okay, the Milgram experiment with Stanley Milgram, here's Stanley Milgram up in the corner here, um, and remember this was the um, switchboard, remember where uh, they had participants and they had a teacher and a learner and they told everybody that they were actually studying the uh, um, effects of punishment on learning and they were looking at um, you know the teacher was supposed to say a word and the learner was supposed to say the word pair and if they got it wrong the teacher was supposed to shock them right um, and so they had this increasing levels of shock and it was um, every time you're supposed to increase the levels of shock all the way till the end and the interesting part was is that there was lots of people that continued on with the experiment even though the learner was pretending as if they were actually in pain and they were screaming and they were saying that they have a heart condition and that they want to get out of here and whatever and they'd look to uh, the conductor, the experimenter, <coughs> the uh, guy in the white lab coat that's sitting there and they'd say, you know, what do I do? And they said, you know, the experiment requires that you continue. And they would, and they would, and there was a large percentage of them that went all the way to the end. Well, there was this experiment that happened um, in the 1960s, um, but then we had more recent experiment uh, where they had uh, a bunch of uh, cases with hospitals and nurses. And so they had this nurse on a psychiatric ward um, who knew that there was supposed to be this new doctor that's supposed to be coming. And they've never met this doctor. Um, and this doctor calls them up and um, gives them their name, whatever the name was that they told them was going to be joining them. Um, and this doctor calls up and says, you know, okay, nurse, um, I'm going to come see patient Smith later on today. Um, I want you to go and give patient Smith this medication um, before I get there because I want it to take effect before I, I actually see patient Smith. Um, so will you please go and give him, um, you know, 50 milligrams of this particular um, medication. So the nurse goes and gets the medication and on the bottle it actually says do not exceed 10 milligrams. This is way beyond what um, was actually on the bottle, um, what the doctor wants her to do. And a lot of the nurses were actually going to follow the orders from the standpoint of it was not a medication that they were familiar with. Um, they oftentimes, you know, went off from, well, you know, doctors have done this before. They've called in um, medications for patients before. Um, and a lot of the nurses actually blindly followed the instructions, despite um, what the uh side of the bottle actually told them. Now, if it was a medication that they were familiar with, they were less likely to follow. But what the experimenters, uh, both these experiments found was is that people are more likely to obey if the person giving the orders is close by. So, for example, in Milgram's experiment, the um, person that's running was running the experiment uh, was sitting right next to the teacher. Uh, in the case of the nurse, they were calling it in, so it wasn't quite close by. Um, if the victim is depersonalized, in the case of um, the uh, San, uh, the Milgram experiment, uh, the learner uh, was in another room. You couldn't even see them. And there's no role models for defiance. And so in the case of the nurse, uh, the nurse hadn't, you know, hadn't had maybe uh, another nurse that said, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, this is a ridiculous amount to give a patient. So they're much more likely to um, obey if those those situations are present. Um, they also uh, found that the foot in the door phenomenon got participants and started, um, particularly in the case of Milgram's experiment. Oops, sorry. In the case of Milgram's experiment, um, they had them start with a very small shock and then work their way up. Since they got them to agree to a very small shock, they were much more likely to progress to higher levels of shock. Okay, so. What about group influence? How does the group uh, influence you? So we talked about um, how we tend to conform and how we tend to obey. What about how we are affected by a group at large? So how is our behavior affected by a group? 
So first of all, we have what we call social facilitation. This is the idea that we perform better on easy tasks when there are fr others, uh, friendly others around. The best example of this is oftentimes in sports. Um, they uh, talk about uh, that um, sports teams are much more likely to win um, when they are at home in front of a friendly crowd compared to if they're away and they got a bunch of uh, crowd members that are booing at them. So social facilitation is basically saying that when you have easy tasks, you perform better in front of a crowd. However, if it's a harder task, so for example, solving a complicated math problem, you're much more likely to go and make a mistake if you're doing it in front of a class. Okay, because it's a little bit harder task to do. Um, social loafing is also uh, it's something that will oftentimes happen, and I see this all the time in classes. Social lo loafing is where you don't work as hard because you're part of a group, and you say, oh, well, my group or these people in my group will take care of it. Okay, so... Uh, the social loafer says, I love this uh, project uh, group, this project group of mine. I don't need to do anything with these people around. Okay. This is oftentimes what I get as complaints about group projects is, is that you're like, oh, I have people that do work hard and they get complaints because they're like, hey, you know what? I don't want to have to um, be pulled down by all these other people that aren't working. Okay. Whereas the person who is social facilitation says, yeah, good for you. I tend to perform better with people around. It kind of gets my nerve up, right? I do better. That's social facilitation. Um, and then lastly, de-individualization. De-individualization happens when you give up your kind of your self-awareness um, in a group situation because of this anonymity of the group. And this is what happens when you have mobs. Um, uh, you will have this flash mob and uh, happens oftentimes, for example, at con rock concerts or, um, you know, in scenarios where uh, they're rioting or looting or whatever. And it would be something that by yourself, you would never do that. It never occur to you, for example, to go and light something on fire or to go and break into that store and steal that television. It never occurred to you to do that by yourself but because you're in the group. Okay, you're much more likely to do it because you're part of the group and it kind of gives you this empowering feeling and this degree of anonymity where I'm part of the group, no one knows it's me. Could have been anyone in the group, right? That's the idea of group influence. However, we also have group think. And group think, so group think is going to be where you want um, harmony in the group so you're less likely to voice a dissenting opinion. So, uh, for example, this cartoon, it says, uh, you know, everybody's all smiling and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it says, say it and so, you've got to be kidding. It says, no idea. This, they don't, no, 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 a thousand times. But they don't say anything because they want harmony within the group. Uh, everybody thinks that uh, somebody else will speak up. Um, they uh, oftentimes have this happen with advisors to political um, candidates because no one wants to speak up and say, um, this is a bad idea. Um, so group think is um, the idea that we, we just want harmony. Group polarization, on the other hand, is when um, the group's tendencies are enhanced when they're, something is discussed as a group. So, for example, um, individually you might say smoking is bad, but then together you start talking about it with a group of people that are against smoking, and you start to realize you're like, smoking kills. And so then, as a result, the individual person should uh, will shift to not only smoking is bad, but smoking should be banned. Okay, lots of other examples of this where, um, you know, where you get a whole bunch of people together that are individually have a particular conviction about a specific event. Like, for example, they may be um, pro-life and on on the whole by themselves, they're pro-life. But then you could put them with a bunch of other pro-life people and they all start to talk together and it enhances um, their pro-lifeness, if you will. And in some regards, it's good from the standpoint of a lot of people are like, oh, it's good because it will enhance their thinking about a particular topic. But at the same point in time, if it's not the topic, then the, the opinion that you want, a lot of people will blame them and say, oh, they're just going along with the group. All right, well, that's it for module 57. Let me know if you have any questions.